Ah, we're back. We're live. Uh, this is uh, Energy in America, except we're not in America. If you can guess from behind me, we're in Nanjing, China. And no problem there. And Lou Puderisi joins us from Nanjing. Hi, Lou. It's nice to, it's nice to see your smiling it's, face so far away. It's great to be here. A bright and sunny Thursday morning in Nanjing. Yeah, Lou is the uh, president of uh, EPRINC, uh, Energy Policy Research Institute. And uh, uh, I forgot to ask him, Lou, why, why exactly are you in China? Uh, a couple of reasons. We just finished up the eighth annual LNG Consumer Producer Conference in uh, Tokyo, Japan. And China is a big, big uh, feature in the future of uh, uh, LNG in the Pacific. And so we have some uh, folks here we want to talk to in Nanjing. I'm also visiting my son, who's uh, working here in Nanjing. Uh, the Puderisi family gets around, what can I say? Uh, <laughs> so what are we calling this show? Uh, something about... So I think uh, we're going to talk about today, we're going to talk about why the U.S. is the primary source of, of energy security for worldwide oil and gas. Mm-hmm. Okay, let's have at it. You have a bunch of slides uh, all the way yeah, from so China. Is, so let's let, let's start out before we get to about. Let's just talk a few seconds about oil. Go to the next slide, and uh, this slide shows you the um, North American oil production and a comment. You know, we're going to make a little comment on the Abkhaz Kurais attack. So I don't know, is the slide up? I can't tell on the... Well, it is now, it will be in a moment. There it is, yes. Okay, there we go, great. So one of the things I wanna point out is this, uh, and I think we've talked about this many times, but when the attack occurred in Saudi Arabia, about 5.7 million barrels a day was taken off the world oil market. That doesn't sound a lot out of 100 million barrels a day of production, but actually it's a quite, in historic uh, occurrences in the past, such a uh, such a incident would have spiked oil prices at twenty, thirty, forty dollars a barrel. Mm -hmm. It moved prices up a little bit, but they've essentially come down. In fact, I'm going to show that to you in a second. But what I want to point out is how the world has changed, and the the really important thing to think about here is that when you look at this particular picture. Uh, the U.S. is now, the U.S. combined with Mexico and Canada, the North American uh, production platform, now amounts to a quarter, over a quarter of the world's oil production. It is exporting net, you know, because flows go in and out, but the net exchange is that it's exporting about 320,000 barrels a day of uh, crude oil to the world market. So it's a force of stability. And I think that combined with expectations that the Saudis would bring things along pretty quickly and that we have this big uh, energy security platform in North America has helped to keep the markets very calm. Mm. And I, I want to show you precisely what that is if you go to the next uh, slide here. If you look at the uh, benchmark, so this is the uh, Standard and Poor's and Platt's uh, spot crude prices. And what I wanted to show you is if you look at the two there are two things called dated Brent and WTI. All, all you need to know about those two terms is the blue line is uh, crude oil that's traded in Europe in the North Atlantic, and the WTI is crude oil that's traded in Houston, more or less. And you can see that right after the attack, uh, the price of oil went from, I don't know, somewhere below 60 to 68 maybe even $69 a barrel. But subsequently, it has completely declined to its uh, post-attack uh, pricing. So the, the one of the benefits, I mean, people like to complain about fracking and the U.S., we got to get rid of fossil fuels. But if you would notice, people don't like it when the price of oil goes up. And it is the benefit of this North American petroleum renaissance that is actually the main character in this more uh, happy out, at least those of us who buy uh, gasoline. Mm -hmm. And this is remarkable in another respect. If we go to the, uh, into the next picture, you can see 
even though OPEC production has been on the decline, right? They try and try to shore up prices. Global output is still growing. And uh, what I wanted to show you here is if you look at these three colors here, so-called other liquids, uh, and part of those other liquids can include biofuels. Uh, global NGLs, now for your audience, that's natural gas liquids. Often when you produce uh, natural gas, you get these petroleum liquids, which can be used in the refining sector, in the petrochemical sector. And you can see from this picture, even though uh, OPEC has successfully reduced its own crude output, the net of the other production in the world market has been a continuing increase in oil production. So this is all in contrast to the Green New Deal and other folks that say we should get rid of petroleum. But as you can see, its growth is what has kept prices in check. And this is remarkable. I mean, this is quite, this is completely a different world than we were used to. And largely because of this tremendous response in North America. Is it sustainable? Then, is, I, is the Renaissance uh, sustainable, though? I believe it's very sustainable. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that in a second. Okay. Uh, there is some debate about how, uh, how, you know, how sustainable it is, you know, how much growth is left in the system. But I don't think we're going to see any decline in U.S. production. And I think we, the Energy Information Agency and most analysts think we will continue to get growth. Most of the debate is how much growth will we get. Now let's go to the next. But one of the things as we enter and sell more natural gas in the world, particularly LNG, is what about the security of natural gas? And that was a big theme at the recent uh, producer consumer conference in Tokyo. So let's go to the next uh, the next picture. And here, you know, we it's really important to understand that the U.S. not just for oil, but it represents a unique and secure uh, natural gas production platform. The first thing is the resource is vast and it's getting bigger and it's very low cost. We operate in a very competitive market with pipeline access to multiple resource basins. So we have a lot of redundancy. So if a pipeline goes down or there's a problem in one basin, we can, we can uh, go to another basin. Uh, uh, we have a very short cycle development. I think we've talked about in the past so that uh, because of the nature of uh, unconventional oil and gas production, you can, in relatively short time, uh, identify a prospect and produce it. And this rapid, this rapid short cycle investment uh, period also allows for a lot of advancement in technology. We also are quite good. Our LNG export facilities can access uh, multiple feedstock sources. Uh, we have predictable siting now, cost-effective construction costs. And the U.S. is not the only country, but it's particularly well known for rule of law, contract sanctity, no destination restrictions on LNG exports, except for, you know, Korea or North Korea or Iran. So when a LNG exports leaves the U.S., uh, the buyer is free to redirect it to other markets. Now, we still have some headwinds. Some groups oppose fossil fuels in the U.S. and worldwide. Some of this is over concern over climate, although uh, if you travel to Asia, you will find out that gas is highly sought after to deal with uh, local air pollution. And we still need to do a lot in Asia to get a more transparent market and trading system. Uh, what is that? What's, the a, next pick. what's a transparent market system? So what happens is in, in, in the United States, uh, we have uh, third party access to storage and pipelines. Everyone knows when a trade takes place in the natural gas market in the U.S. that that trade probably reflects the true value of the gas at that time. We also have very uh, well established futures market. So buyers and sellers can hedge over time. They can literally move production over time by putting it into storage. If they think it's going to be more value in the future, they can put more into storage, or they can take gas that's in storage and move it into a prop period. So the U.S. is the most open, transparent, and competitive gas market in the world. Right? Mm -hmm. Those features do not exist 
adequately yet in Asia. And that's going to be part of future work we're going to be doing. Uh -huh. And the other thing I think that people may not be aware of, if we go to the next picture, is that the uh, there's something called the Potential Gas Committee. It exists at the Colorado School of Mines. It's a very well-respected group. Every two years, they do a big assessment of both oil and gas. And their natural gas resource assessment by, air, by area in the U.S. showed an increase of 22% over 2016. So the U.S. now has a record of 3 billion, 374 trillion uh, cubic feet of uh, 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 potential gas in the U.S. And you can see this by, by region in the map. Okay, so the next picture also is another feature that I think uh, it shows that I think is not, there's a lot of fighting over pipelines in the U.S. and we do need to get a little better at public acceptance and uh, coming to terms of building the pipeline so they can move from, the gas can be moved from where it is to where it's needed. But uh, if you look at this particular map, you can see, if you look at Utica, Marcellus, Adrian, these are big gas resources in the northeast of the United States. And the pipelines are getting built to move this gas to the Gulf Coast, where it can go either by pipeline into Mexico, into industrial activities in the Gulf Coast, or to as a feedstock for the production of liquefied natural gas. Mm -hmm. Now, we still have a problem in the Northeast. The people in New York think uh, that gas is bad, and there's a big fight taking place now in New York. New residencies and businesses in Brooklyn and other parts of New York City have asked for gas hookups. But uh, the main gas uh, supplier for New York has told them that's not possible because we, because uh, New York State, especially Governor Cuomo, has not authorized any gas pipeline, any new gas pipelines to cross into New York. Well, this is a climate change uh, uh, issue, isn't it? And um, people, people, I think it's, come, it's, come, it's difficult for me to see it strictly. I, I think it's partly a climate change issue, keep it in the ground. It's partly they don't like fracking, even though it's taking place in another state. And it's partly that people are extremely ignorant. Uh -huh. I think that's probably the biggest one. Uh -huh. And people are ignorant because uh, when they don't get this gas, they're going to have to fire up those cold fire utility boilers to provide the electricity. Uh, since the guys are going to have to put in electric stoves instead of gas stoves. So, so if, if Greta I mean, Thunberg, uh, emissions... if Greta Thunberg uh, showed up, if Greta Thunberg, uh, you know, the, the, the 15, 16 year old. Yeah, who... yeah I'm sorry. I, I don't think we should be establishing that very complicated national policy on the basis of 14 year olds. OK, <laughs> I understand but how Michael, popular Michael, she is. But... My, my question is this, though. I mean, what, what do you what do you say to them? What do you and what does the, the, you know, the gas industry say to them? Uh, I, I, I heard. Well, I don't know what the gas industry ago. says to them. And, and yeah. And, well, basically, and, the U.S. has had a remarkable decline in climate emissions over the last 12 years. The largest decline of any other major country, any other country in the world. And that's largely because U.S. natural gas continues to drive out coal use in the power sector in the US. So that's what I would say, but you have to understand for these people, this is not a technocratic issue, it's a religious issue. And if it's a religious issue, you can't really have a discussion with them because they don't want to talk about the technical issues, you know, how much electric power, or petroleum resources are we gonna to need to build all the windmills? What do we do about disposal? I mean. There's a huge balancing kind of calculation that should be made. And I don't think these particular individuals are necessarily happy with a climate tax or something like that. They want something much more radical. And actually, I think that's quite, uh, as I, I think I pointed out before, in four or five liberal states in the last election, various climate initiatives, a carbon tax, a mandated uh, wind and solar in the utility sector 
in states like Oregon, Arizona, New Mexico, and uh, Washington. These were all defeated at the polls. So I think we have a disconnect here in the country. I don't know how we fix that. I don't know what we do about that. But yes, we should be working on climate issues. No, we shouldn't be stupid about it. That's kind mm -hmm. of where I am on this. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to ask you that, but but suppose I mean, are we doing enough? You you know, you uh, implied, um, and maybe this is a, a, an obvious truth that we need to build more pipelines in order to support the greater demand and the greater export of gas. Um, yes, I would but, say the answer to that is, and I'm saying that this gas is largely going to Asia or Mexico where in Mexico it's replacing heavy fuel oil, which is, which is bad for local air pollution and also bad for the climate. And it's, when it goes to Asia, it's largely backing out coal. I don't mm -hmm. really understand the objection to it. Mm -hmm. Now, they could be arguing it's not happening fast enough, that Asia should be building wind and solar and batteries, but and by the way, the Asian countries are extremely cautious about this because their view is coal is cheap. And before we sign up for this gas, we want to know that we're not going to get burned if gas prices start to go up. And this is a big issue in China now. So you'll yeah. see China entering the gas market, but buying it for one, two, three years, making some long-term commitments, but a lot of short-term commitments. Mm -hmm. So what about what about uh, Nan, Nanjing? I mean, what, what's the uh, what's the general um, view of this matter? What, and the Chinese in general, they they still use a lot of coal. Uh, they have some clean they use coal. A lot I of know. Coal. China, right? Um, so China tends to be very pragmatic about this. Right? They are very interested in gas. Uh, there's a political mandate to deal with local air pollution. This is mostly particulate matter, PM two point five. No one's really preoccupied with climate, but if they see that the air's dirty, it's politically very difficult for the regime. Mm -hmm. So if you go on the streets in Nanjing, almost all the motor scooters and uh, motorbikes are gas. I mean, are electric. Mm. There's almost no noise on the street. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can see large trucks that run through the street with a big funnel shooting water into the air. And that particularly is a way for the water vapor to, uh, you know, connect with the particulates and it falls to the ground. So mm -hmm. they are very, very constant. They're very, very focused on the issue of urban air pollution. Yeah. Do you see, uh, do you see uh, solar? Do you see wind? Do you see any turbines around? Do you, you see, do you see a solar lot of on solar. rooftops? You do see solar a lot of places but remember most of the urban community lives in extremely dense high rises right 30 40 50 stories very dense they are not that amenable to solar or wind they might be but they would be uh at a position somewhere mm -hmm. they're not really a local you can't if you're on the 44th floor of an 80 story building you can't really get a lot of bang out of solar you know? mm -hmm. so, <laughs> and air conditioning in china is very important it's hot here <laughs> yeah well it's probably going to get hotter too but uh yeah. i just wonder where the government is you know on a, a kind of mono e mono basis uh, are they encouraging solar and wind uh, or are they enc encouraging gas uh, and what, what no, is the priority they're definitely for the government encouraging they have a very active wind and solar program. Uh, their solar program is one of the reasons we have a trade dispute with them, because they're selling that. Uh, they're selling a lot of those uh, photo, uh, you know, the solar panels in the U.S. Um, so yeah, they're very, they're very much part of an all of the above strategy, which includes nuclear, uh, solar, wind, and we've done a paper on it, which is on our web website, which also was reproduced in the oil and gas journal about China's search for blue skies. And it kind of lays out the trade-offs they're facing with there. Mm -hmm. So who is at they the They also conference? are concerned about where they get their gas from, domestic production, mm -hmm. overland from Myanmar, Russia, mm -hmm. and, uh, the Caspian states, and imports of LNG. And there's no, there's no trade war on gas, I take it. 
Well, technically, there is a uh, a tariff on imported gas. Now, we'll see what happens with that. Mm -hmm. But only imported gas from the U.S. So I'm, I'm more interested. I mean, I, I think we need to fix this trade war. I mean, I've told that to people. Um, but the real interesting issue from the analyst point of view or for the world LNG mark is how fast will China's gas demand for LNG grow? Because they can buy that gas from different sources. And then the U.S. gas can just go into the mix in other countries. But long term, we are going to get this trade war fixed and U.S. gas is going to come to China. I, I mm -hmm. have no doubt about that. Mm -hmm. Well, then let me ask you this, though. Suppose, suppose we have... Uh... Other sources are available, and the, and the current uh, tariffs, the Chinese tariffs, uh, impede the importation of gas into China. Um, doesn't that mean that the infrastructure by which the gas is exported from the U.S. and imported into China um, is um, you know, not as robust as it might be, because uh, other countries are supplying it instead? So what I'm, what I'm asking really is, doesn't gas go where the infrastructure is? And if you don't have the infrastructure yes, and, from your but, source, you lose out. Yeah. No, because, I mean, gas goes where the infrastructure is, but it also is competitively priced. So, for example, the Japanese have a very big conglomerate called JERA, which is a combination of uh, LNG uh, trading companies, big trading companies and utilities. And they are a massive buyer of LNG, right? But they buy it as a portfolio then they redistribute it to different parts of south asia or even europe depending on on what's happening to relative prices so there are elements of the oil market beginning to emerge in the lng market in which uh relative prices dictate the distribution of lng i'm not saying the tariffs are good you know are, are un ineffective they could ultimately limit the total growth of LNG demand in China, but I haven't seen that yet. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think there are other features as well, so it's really what a short about, term. What about uh, oil, Lou? What about oil? Are we selling oil to the Chinese? Yes, we are. Yes. How interesting and that it should I'm come not to sure that. the tariff schedule on that. It may have been exempted by the Chinese. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it was still. But a lot of U.S. oil is going into Asia. Mm -hmm. So that, that brings me to a question I wanted to ask you, namely, at, at the conference you're attending here in Nanjing, uh, who's there? Uh, from what countries, from what regions in the world, and why? Oh, well, I'm just here having some, uh, you know, meetings with local officials and stuff. The conference in Tokyo, we had uh, 20 energy ministers. We had most all the major countries in the world which either export or buy LNG uh, present, including the Russians, including the Chinese National Petroleum Company and the Novatech from Russia. So it was a worldwide uh, club of gas producers and consumers. Well, what it shows, uh, doesn't it, is that, uh, is that oil and gas is more global now than it ever was. And that, um, uh, you know, you really need to be involved in these conferences. You need to have uh, that transparent market you talked about. Uh, you need yes. to have the connections um, to get the best price. You, you need to get out. I mean, you're, you're traveling, for example, <laughs> traveling everywhere. Yes, but we're sort of a research. We're not that important. A lot of companies are doing that. But So if you go here, just let me just show you. I, we don't need to look at these, but let's take a look at U.S. Uh, uh, the last three slides very quickly here. I think they're just... And then... This just, uh, uh, in terms of uh, what this slide shows is very important because some LNG facilities around the world are fed by a single source. And if that source is disrupted, uh, you have a problem. But what I wanted to point out here, this is the, uh, uh, the Sabine gas. Uh, it's an it's a LNG facility in the Gulf. If you take a look here, it can access gas from many places in the U.S. So that's very important. That adds a lot of redundancy and stability to the U.S. system. Mm -hmm. And then if we go to the next, uh, the next slide here, you can see just by 2020, the U.S. is going to be 
essentially providing more than 20% of 2018 global LNG trade. All right. So we are ramping up. This is happening, right? And then finally, the last one, you can see that prices for LNG, uh, uh, this shows the price. JKM view that as the Asian price. And Henry Hump, Henry Hub is the kind of the price in the Gulf of Mexico. You can see that as these gas supplies have entered the market, the price of gas has fallen, not just in the US, but also in Asia. So, and this cheap gas right now, I don't think this price is sustainable, but this cheap gas is being purchased at record rates around the world, including in Europe to go into storage. So it's, a, it's, it's, it's having a big effect on the world gas market. And I think we can conclude, that concludes the slide presentation anyway. Okay, and I wanted to get into sustainability. I wanted to get into the sustainability of the growth, uh, you know, given, uh, you know, geopolitical considerations, given, given the trade war, given, given climate change, because climate change is going to change the way people look at fossil fuels, even if they're not, you know, uh, they, they don't have the same view as the New York uh, governor has. Uh, or, <laughs> uh, they, they, you know, yeah. they, may, they may have, uh, they may develop a view over time when they have extreme storms and other implications of climate change. So, you know, it, look into the future with me, Lou. What does it look like? I think the future is uh, well, is one in which uh, we will see a, a decline in coal at least on a percentage basis. We will see continued growth in gas and a much slower growth in uh, liquid petroleum. And I don't see anything though by 2040 or 2050 that substantially alters the percentage contribution of wind and solar and renewables as a percentage basis. I see enormous growth in wind and renewables. Mm -hmm. But as a percentage in 2040, most of the change will be in a reduction in consumption through efficiency, through more, uh, you know, ride sharing, whatever you want to say that we're going to be, we're going to be more efficient in how we use these fuels, but we're not going to be abandoning these fossil fuels any, anytime soon. Mm -hmm. And that's just based on a traditional cost analysis. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe, maybe that 16-year-old knows something thousands of engineers do not know. Okay, and that would be good to know. Uh, maybe there's some secret sauce out there that I haven't seen, and I'm very interested in learning about it. <laughs> but that's the reality. I know that people don't like to talk about the reality, but that is the reality of how the world works. Well, it's always nice to talk to you about it. I, I have one more question, though. If you look into the future... Sure. Uh, you know, I imagine that uh, if you look into the future, you're going to see the U.S. as a bigger and bigger exporter uh, of, uh, of gas, for one thing, and uh, maybe maybe some oil too. Um, but where where are the hubs going to be, so to speak? You know, for example, it so seems that to me that uh, that's it's not more likely that the hub will be uh, in Asia, in Japan, than in China, for example. No. Right, but the problem is. Um, the reason we have great hubs in the U.S., like Henry Hub and other trading, is because we have we have a whole bunch of features. We have storage, we have uh, third-party access, we have uh, um, a very active and transparent physical market and a financial market, and we have confidence from the regulators and the participants that no one's manipulating that market, right? That, that market is well regulated and that when you you make a transaction you have a confidence in the transaction mm -hmm. we're not there yet in asia so yeah china would make sense because they're big they're connected to pipelines and domestic production but it's unclear to me yet that the participants in the market would have a lot of confidence of a trading platform in china but let's see what the chinese do singapore is another option as is tokyo mm -hmm. One thing I get out of this but is we that we'd we better watch out. We'd better watch. We'd better follow these things. We'd better follow energy. It's so important to our global society. Uh, this is part of it. Gas and, uh, to some extent, oil is part of our global 
society, and it's not, it's not, um, it's not just yes or no or black or white. Uh, it's a matter of keeping and the remember, lights burning everywhere. The 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 new regulations coming into f effect for 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 ocean vessels is going to require a very clean fuel in 2020 January, mm -hmm. and over time, that clean fuel is going to be in many cases LNG, not a petrol, not a liquid product, because that new liquid product, with all the sulfur removed or most of it, is going to be much more expensive. So, does the same thing apply to uh, airline traffic? Is the uh, fuel used uh, for airlines uh, cleaner or dirtier than the kind that'll be used in maritime uh, travel? Actually, there's a bit more sulfur in jet fuel than there is in distillate for road vehicles. And one of the reasons for that is that uh, you need the sulfur to provide lubricity for the functioning of jet engines. And EPA has been very cautious about going after the sulfur content because if airplanes started to fly out of the sky they might blame them so i think uh, that's going to go in a very careful the the airlines are experimenting with blending in biofuels and more efficiency and probably the big the big thing we're going to see in airlines is more efficient engines mm. and we'll probably see some lower sulfur over time but they're going to go cautiously with that well you know as we get uh, closer to 2020 uh and you continue all your travels all around the world, you might, you might consider going uh, by sea uh, rather than by air, Lou. <laughs> I'm coming your way in January, by the way. Good. <laughs> we'll be here. We'll make you happy. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Lou Pugliarisi of ePrink, uh, right. coming to us from Nanjing, China. Uh, and it's been uh, seamless to talk to you on the Internet. and Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Yeah, that's great. We'll talk to you again soon, Bye, Lou. Jenny. Take care. Aloha. <laughs> See you soon. Take care. Bye-bye.